Over here to my right is the apartment complex where police officers have really been concentrated this past hour and a half. This is Building B. They've been talking to a lot of uh, people who live here, going in and out of some apartments. Homeowners are calling for safety improvements after this accident, saying it's one of many. Last week, they say another car knocked down this fence. Kingsport City Schools have had this shoulder harness seatbelt system since 2010, but if other school districts want to buckle up. It's not going to come cheap. In fact, a new NTSB report shows very few tires on U.S. roads are registered, and that could be potentially dangerous for you. Like in the traffic. Sitting on her front porch, Margie Hale takes in all the changes she's seen throughout her four decades living in this home. This road was built about 69, I guess. Including the latest change across the street that's caused a lot of controversy. The opening of an opioid addiction treatment center that will prescribe methadone. I know they need it, but I just wish they'd put it somewhere else. Overmountain Recovery actually opened this week. City and county leaders now say they are going to stay on top of things in the area to make sure that neighbors like Margie stay safe. We want the community to feel safe in their house. Washington County Sheriff Ed Graybill says he's going to have extra deputies patrolling the area around the county. If you feel uncomfortable, something at night, Give us a call, we'll come check it out for you. Johnson City Police are conducting direct patrols and traffic enforcement on the road in front of the facility. Even Washington County Commissioner Brian Davenport is being proactive, working with law enforcement. I'm sure this location will be safe, but we're concerned about when people get out on the roads, the traffic that's involved and stuff like that. The clinic has two dedicated security officers on staff and 24-hour surveillance. We want our community to know we continue to want to be good partners with them on safety and security. Um, and I would, you know, ask them to reach out to me um, directly if, if there's any concerns. Margie isn't taking any chances, though. My son-in-law says he's going to put up security cameras. Sydney Cameron, News Channel 11 in your corner. My life's been full. I've savored much. Good friends, good times, a loved one's touch. You say that fits your son? Yes. Nearly eight months after his son's death, it's still hard for Dr. Clay Renfro to talk about it. That I can tell that from the stories okay. that you tell. His only son, Frederick and Dr. Renfro, shared a lot. A career in medicine and a love of fishing. But I was with him when he caught that. And he fought it for a good while before he ever got him on. On land. Renfro also had a long fight with opioid addiction. From an early age, he suffered severe pain from kidney stones and depression, which eventually led to addiction. Knew there was some problem for several years, but getting him to accept that he had a problem was a, the big issue. In March, at just 46 years old, Renfro died from an overdose of an extremely powerful synthetic opioid called fentanyl. Is a significant threat. Fentanyl is a narcotic painkiller typically used for cancer patients. It's similar to morphine, but is much more potent. Illicit versions made and sold on the streets are up to 10,000 times more powerful. From 2015 to 2016, both Tennessee and Virginia saw big increases in drug overdose deaths related to fentanyl. It can be absorbed through the skin, transdermal, or it can be inhaled. Using a combination of sugar and artificial pour sweetener, out. Tommy I'm Farmer with the Tennessee salt. Bureau of Investigation how showed us just how dangerous fentanyl can be. So these specks on my finger right now, if this was fentanyl... More than enough to overdose you. Lethal. Lethal. Farmer says it only takes the equivalent of three grains of sugar to overdose on fentanyl. However, the consistency of fentanyl is much more fine, like a powder, making it easier to spread. You can see the powder. And if you breathe, I you, can smell it. You can not only smell it, you can taste the sweetener, the sugar in the back, just out of just opening that up and just the simple tossing it around. That's what can happen with fentanyl. It can be transferred with fentanyl. And this is what makes it so dangerous for law enforcement. <laughs>
Thunder. It was a routine traffic stop. Earlier this year, a Washington County Sheriff's deputy got lucky when a K-9 alerted him to drugs inside a car. A field test showed it was heroin, but Lieutenant Doug Gregg says it wasn't until it was sent off to the TBI crime lab that officers found out there was also fentanyl mixed in. He was wearing gloves for precaution, and that was about it. He had no uh, dust mask on. He had no goggles. Other officers haven't been so lucky. Just a few weeks ago in Memphis, several officers had to be treated at a hospital for a suspected exposure. TBI crime labs are seeing more cases of illicit fentanyl. Five years ago, there were only 12 confirmed cases in the state. So far this year, there are more than 300, including more than three dozen right here in the Tri-Cities. In Southwest Virginia, there were more than 600 confirmed cases last year. So it's changing our dynamics uh, of how we have to protect law enforcement and our first responders, how we protect the public. Almost every law enforcement agency in the Tri-Cities now equips its officers with naloxone to protect themselves and others from accidental overdosing. It's a medication that can reverse the effects of an overdose. Some law enforcement agencies like the Washington County Sheriff's Office even have naloxone for their canines because their sniffing puts them at higher risk of exposure. <laughs> Just like in the Washington County traffic stop, users may not realize other drugs are laced with fentanyl. It's not a matter of if it's going to kill you, it's a matter of when it kills you. You will overdose. Overdose like Frederick Renfro. Addicts are just your everyday uh, son or daughter. They shouldn't be ostracized. But Dr. Renfro hopes his son's story can help save the next person and give meaning to his son's premature death. Sydney Cameron, News Channel 11 in your corner. Go anywhere in Greene County and you're likely to see an inmate working in the community. Normally, 60 of them work on location, fixing cars at the county garage or caring for animals at the Humane Society. This is a really, really good program and they do a lot of work. Especially for the Greenville Parks and Recreation Department, says Parks and Rec Director Butch Patterson. Weeding, mowing, picking up trash. All that work saves Greene County an estimated $1.2 million every year. But the program comes with its own challenges. Even though inmates working on location are monitored by employees trained by the Greene County Sheriff's Office, escapes still happen like the one last month at the Greenville Rec Center. An inmate was working here in the gym and asked his supervisor to go to the bathroom. Instead, he walked out the door and stole a city vehicle. Within days of that escape, another Greene County inmate walked off another work detail. We reached out to jails across the Tri-Cities and found out nearly 20 inmates have escaped from work details in roughly the last five years. But the most recent walk-offs in Greene County actually prompted the Sheriff's Department to temporarily suspend its program. Well, there was some red flags. Greene County Jail Administrator Roger Willett heads up the work detail program which was reinstated a few weeks ago with some changes. He admits the most recent inmates may not have been good candidates to work in the community, saying they had issues with failing to appear in court and evading arrest charges. We have to be a lot tighter on the ones that we are sending out. Uh, we, we can't take chances on individuals that have had issues in the past. Inmates will also start out in the most secure job sites now, like at the jail, before moving to less secure sites like Tusculum College. It will probably be individuals that have proven they've done well at other crews, they've pulled their time in here as they're getting ready to get out, we can, we can put them in positions where they can have a little bit more trust in law. But inmates will no longer be able to work at the less secure sites on the weekends after last month's escape. It was an unfortunate incident. Patterson says he understands why the decision was made, but Parks and Rex is already seeing the effects of being short-handed on the weekends. We have one maintenance guy. So we've been, in, over the years past, we've relied on having one or two or maybe even three inmates. Willett says the sheriff's office may reevaluate that decision in the coming months, but for now, their priority is making sure inmates are staying on the job. Sydney Cameron, News Channel 11 in your corner.